Let's get started with Unit 1, Lesson 14, Background Painter. All right, getting started. The first thing you're going to need is Painter Plus. If you have it in your backpack, you can go ahead and import it like this. Otherwise, just go ahead and copy-paste the code. I've clicked on painterplus.java, and now once I copy the whole class, I can create a new file called painterplus.java. Delete this first line here and paste in everything you just copied. We can go ahead and commit this. For the message, I'll say that I created Painter Plus. Next step is to create the Background Painter class. So we're going to create a new Java file called backgroundpainter.java. In Java, every class has to be in its own file, so we're going to follow that convention here. The first thing we want to do in backgroundpainter.java is to import all of the classes from the org code neighborhood package. That's already done for you here on line one, so you can ignore this step. Next, we want to write the class header for the background painter class. In Java, a class header looks like this. We start with the keywords public class. Then we define the class name, which in this case matches the file name and is background painter. Note, don't forget to extend the painter plus class. So in this instance, background painter is going to be a subclass of painter plus. In Java, we can create a subclass using the keyword extends. And we want to extend the superclass, which is painter plus. Go ahead and create an open and closing bracket for this class. And your class definition for background painter will be between these brackets. The next step is to write a constructor signature for the background painter class. In Java, a constructor signature looks like a method that has the same name as the class that it constructs. So let's define it here. Public background painter. Next step, inside the constructor, call super to call the superclass constructor. So we can just use the keyword super, call it like a method. And by doing this, any call to the background painter constructor will be delegated to the painter plus constructor, which is the superclass. Now we're ready to begin writing our methods to actually paint the background. Let's define a method using a method signature. So it'll be a public void, and we'll call it paint background. Paint background is going to accept a color as a parameter. So we can call this method paint background and pass in any color we want as a string. That will be assigned to the variable color here. For example, if I wanted to paint my background to be blue, I could call paint background blue from some other function. And then color, the value of color would be blue. We'll come back to this in the next exercise. To actually start painting the background, let's observe what this animation does. There are a few things that the background painter does. First, if it's currently in the middle of a row, it will move forward, and if it's standing on a blank space, it will paint that space. Next, notice what the painter does at the east end of the row. It will stop, turn right, move down, paint, turn right again to face west, and then move west. Similarly, at the west end of the row, it will stop, turn left to face south, move south, paint, turn left to face east, and then move east. This continues all the way until we reach the end of the last row. We want the painter to continue for as long as it's able to move, that is, until it reaches the end of the map. So we're going to use a while loop. We want the painter to paint while it's able to move, so we can call the method can move. Can move is a boolean, so we can use it as part of the while loop 
condition. You can see the documentation for Painter can move for turns true if there's no barrier one space ahead in the direction the Painter is currently facing. So that means uh, we can use this to determine whether the Painter can still move forward or not. Okay, so we only want our Painter to paint on blank space. We don't want it to paint over the pattern in white. So we can check whether there's currently paint underneath the painter by calling is on paint. This is also documented in the painter class. So if we're not currently on paint, we want to apply paint in the color that we passed into the method here. After painting, We'll move one space. This code will get us through one row, but we want to handle all of the rows on the map. So how do we know if there are any rows left to paint? Well, if we've reached the bottom of the map, we've reached the southernmost point. Therefore, the painter cannot move south. How do we know if the painter can move south? Well, in the painter class, we have a version of the can move method that accepts a direction. So you can see this example, my painter dot can move south. This returns a boolean just like the other can move method. The version of can move that doesn't accept a direction only checks the space in front of the painter. But if we pass in a direction, we can find out whether the painter can move south or not. So let's check can we move south? If so, then let's add handling for the next row. Before we write our next row method, let's stop and review what we have so far. We have one while loop that will execute uh, as long as the painter is able to move forward. So every time the painter is on a square, it's going to check whether there's paint already there. It's going to paint if there isn't any paint there. It's going to move forward, which we know it can do. And then if it can move south, we're going to call next row. Note that this happens on every square in the row not just at the end of the row. All right, so now we need a method called next row. We can define a method in the same way as we defined paint background. The void next row. And it's going to accept a color as well. The first thing we want to do since this is called on every square in the row, if we're still in the middle of a row, we don't want to do anything special. We just want to keep painting and moving on. How do we know if we're in the middle of the row? We use the, the can move method. So if we can move, we want to move on. We can actually negate this using the not operator. So. To see if we cannot move, we call not can move. So the entirety of this block will only execute if the painter cannot move forward. So the painter cannot move forward, therefore we know that we're not in the middle of a row, but at the end. We could be either at the east end or at the west end. First, let's handle the case where we're at the east end. To check whether we're at the east end, we can use the method is facing east. This is also located in the painter class.
Note that we have a, cor a corresponding method for each direction. So if we're facing east and we're at the end of the lot, then what do we want to do? We want to turn right, move down, turn right again, so we'll be facing west. So let's write that out. We'll turn right, then we'll be facing south. If we are able to move and not in the last row, we're going to move south. We're going to turn right again so that we can face west and start the next row. Otherwise, if we're not facing east at the beginning of this and we know that we can't move, then we must be facing west. So, this first block here we know we'll only run at the eastern end of a row, and this one will only run at the western end of a row. If we're at the western end of a row, we do very similar behavior, but opposite direction. So, turn left to face south. We can copy the same logic and paste it. If we can move, we're not in the last row, so we move south. And then we turn left again to face east. This completes our background painter.java file, so we can go ahead and commit it. And save it here to the backpack. Now let's move on to exercise three and actually start using this class. This exercise, we're going to need both Pattern Painter and Background Painter. So just like I copied Painter Plus in the previous exercise, I'm going to go to the source code here for Pattern Painter. Copy the whole thing. Create a new file, Pattern Painter, delete this line, and then paste it in. I can go ahead and commit Pattern Painter because I won't be making any changes to it. Now that we have our Background Painter and our Pattern Painter, we can start with this exercise here. In Java, every program starts with a main method. When I click the Run button, it executes the main method. So in our case, my neighborhood is the class that holds main. You can see when I click Run, nothing happens. But for example, if I type system.out.println hello, then our console says hello. This only happens because I typed this into the main method. If I cut this out of main and put it into, say, painter plus constructor, and then run again, you see there's no output because we didn't call anything from main. So what do we actually want to make this program do? Well, we want to make it paint this mural. How do we do that? Well, there's going to be two painters, as you can see, a pattern painter and a background painter. Pattern painter is this dude over in the bottom right. He had just already painted this whole pattern. And this background painter here is the guy currently painting here. So we see there's two painter objects that were created. So in Java, to create objects, we do something called instantiation, which involves calling a constructor. So first, let's create the Pattern Painter. And in Java, to call a constructor, we use the keyword new. 
Now let's do the same thing with Background Painter. And I'm going to use Copy and Paste to save time. Painters in the Code.org neighborhood need to have some amount of paint in their bucket in order to paint anything. So let's give them some paint. First, we'll give my Pattern Painter some paint. We just created it, so it's not holding any paint yet. So let's take the My Pattern Painter object and give it some paint. So we have the set paint method that you can look up here. It's inherited from Painter. Sets the number of units of paint in the Painter object's paint bucket. Value passes negative, nothing happens. So we're going to give it 100 units of paint. That should be plenty to paint this pattern. Now this only applies to the first object we created here, My Pattern Painter, because we've called set paint on that object. To give my background painter paint, we'll need to call set paint on that, that one separately. 200 units should be plenty for the background. Let's go ahead and run our program and see what happens. When I click run, you can see that we've created at least one painter here. There are actually two painters, but they overlap so you can't really tell. Anyway, to go ahead and paint the pattern, to paint the mural, we're going to need to call a method on my pattern painter. Which method should we call? Well, let's go over to my to patternpainter.java. Look at the methods it has. Paint pattern mural paints a pattern across the entire neighborhood. This looks like what we want. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this method name, paste it here. My pattern painter paint pattern mural. We'll need to call it using a string to define the color that we want to paint. Next example, we're using purple, so... Oh no, we're using white, so I'll go ahead with that. Notice that I've put this runner on maximum speed. You can see the background painter is actually standing here at the original spot while the pattern painter goes and works. So now that the mural has been painted, let's paint the background. We have our background painter here. We'll want to call a method on it. What method do we call? Go to backgroundpainter.java. We called it paint background, so I'm going to copy that method name. What color do we want it to be? Example, it's purple, so I'll use that. Let's go ahead and run. Since the program starts over, we have to wait for the mural to paint itself. And now the background painter can go ahead. It looks like there's a bug in our program. Notice that at the spots where the background painter turns around, there isn't any paint. So what can we do about that? Let's go back to backgroundpainter.java. Notice that the spots of paint that are missing happen at the end of rows just before the painter turns around. Where does that happen in our code? Right here. So what we need to do is paint purple where there is only background. Where else do we do that? We do that up here. So we can go ahead and copy and paste that in. Now let's run our program again and see what changed. after the pattern painter finishes the mural. We can see the background painter now paints every blank space purple. This concludes the solution to lesson 14. So I'll leave with a few points. Notice that my neighborhood is pretty short. We're only doing a few things here. We're creating a pattern painter, a background painter, handing them some paint, and telling them to get to work. This is the mark of good code design. Our main method should be very short and very abstract. How the pattern painter actually paints and how the background painter paints should be left up to the implementations of those classes. And you can see that here. This actually gets pretty complex. This is the strength of object-oriented programming. We can abstract out complex tasks into 
uh, very simple and short calls to objects. Also, another note on the use of the parameters for these methods. Both of these accept a string called color. It's a paint pattern mural, accepts a color, and paint background also accepts a color. Note that uh, in our case, paint background paints purple, but the string purple doesn't appear anywhere in paint, background painter. Similarly, paint pattern paints white, but the string white doesn't appear anywhere. We just have a string color. So why is that useful? Let's say we want to paint a different color scheme, such as a black mural and an orange background. To do that, all I have to do is change the colors that get passed into these methods. This gives us a lot of control over the things we care about, such as the color, without having to worry about the actual implementation of how these painters work.